Hello everybody, my name is Kat and I will be talking about Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own today. A Room of One's Own is a collection of stream of consciousness essays that were conceived when Virginia Woolf was asked to give lectures on women in fiction. In the essay, Virginia Woolf addresses the audience both as herself and as a narrator that she asks the audience to call Mary. She discusses various male institutions that were historically denied to women or oppressed women. Within the lecture, she creates a narrative that describes how she began to research for her lecture. She states that while gathering research to give her lecture, she noticed that men write of women, but women write neither of men nor of other women. And she questions why this is. To emphasize her point, she creates a fictional narrative following Shakespeare's fictitious sister, who was refused access to education, wealth, and property ownership because she was a woman and so was unable to develop literature of her own. Wolf suggests that she would have been equally as able to write had she been given the same privileges and opportunities as her brother. In the end, she encourages the creation of literature that would include women's experiences and ways of thinking. In order to understand why Wolf took this stance, it's important to look at her life. Virginia Woolf was born in London, England in 1882. Her father was Leslie Steffen, the first editor of the Dictionary of National Biography. Her mother was Julia Jackson, who was well known for her self-sacrificing personality and was considered to be the ideal for Victorian women. She was the third of four children with two brothers and one sister. She and her sister were never given the same opportunities or education as their brothers, and this bothered Woolf. In 1895, when Virginia was 13, her mother died. Her half-sister died shortly after in 18. 97. In 1904, her father died. As she was dealing with the deaths in her family, her half-brother sexually abused her and her sister. These traumas led to Wolf's first nervous breakdown. In 1906, her brother died, and she saved herself from another breakdown through her writing. She started to link art with writing and wanted to attain a different kind of beauty, achieve a symmetry by means of infinite discords, achieve in the end some kind of whole made of shivering fragments. There are a few notable influences at the time of Wolf writing the lectures that add important context to the contents of her arguments. In 1870, married women were given the right to own and control personal property with the 1870 Married Women's Act. This act allowed married women to be the legal owners of any money that they earned, as well as the ability to inherit, instead of the money or inheritance going only to their husbands. This lecture was also written around the time when women won the right to vote in England, with the representation of the People Act of 1918. Understanding these social and life events leading up to the writing of A Room of One's Own is important to understand the themes of the lecture and the reasons behind it. In A Room of One's Own, Wolf claims that without financial or intellectual freedom, women will never be able to live up to their potential. A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction, and that, as you will see, leaves the great problem of the true nature of woman and the true nature of fiction unsolved. Because women have not been given financial or intellectual freedom, they have not been able to create fiction or any other literature that addresses the true nature of women. In describing Mary Carmichael's imaginary novel, Wolf claims that it's no great work, but give her a room of her own and 500 a year, let her speak her mind and leave out the half that she now puts in, and she will write a better book one of these days. Wolf stresses the potential rather than the inherent ability of women to write, and emphasizes the idea that the work that the artists produce is determined by their social situation and the opportunities they receive to develop themselves. Wolf argues that women need financial independence in order to control their own life and social situation, which would then lead to the ability to gain intellectual freedom, and finally, to being able to write. She claims that this freedom has been historically kept from women and that even those with literary or artistic talents are unable to find work in the literary arts because of a lack of opportunity and not a lack of ambition. When referring to Charlotte Bronte, Wolfe claims that Bronte was unable to detach herself from the bitterness of her situation, leading to foolish novels. She will write of herself where she should write of her characters. She is at war with her lot. How could she but help die young, cramped and thwarted? However, this depiction of Bronte suggests that her experience is that of being a woman, and especially of being a woman with creative and intellectual ambitions. Wolf characterizes Bronte as a woman who was suffocated by the society in which she lived until she lost all of her potential. The narrator of Wolf's essay mentions that she received a significant inheritance on the same day that women won the right to vote in England, and that of the two, the vote and the money, the money I own seemed infinitely the more important. This suggests that Wolf believes that without financial freedom, a woman's independence is restricted, 
and that, therefore, the vote can do little to help her gain agency and impact society. This idea is still used in the contemporary feminist argument that legal equity means little if women are still paid less for the same job and remain economically dependent on men. In A Room of One's Own, Wolf briefly mentions that the unequal opportunities for women have kept women back from their potential, a thought which she expanded on in her 1931 talk, Professions for Women, to include that these unequal opportunities negatively affect all society. In the narrative that Wolf creates in A Room of One's Own, the female narrator is barred from entering the fictional Oxbridge College library, though her male contemporaries are not. Wolf saw this restriction from access to knowledge as being oppressive towards the intellectual freedom of women. Wolf claimed that a woman's place in the current society had stunted her intellectual growth and creativity, and urged women to break away from the angel of the house image and stop sacrificing themselves in favor of men. She claims that their society had been formed by the so-called instincts of the different sexes, leading men to be the breadwinners and women to be the angels of the house. The phrase angel in the house comes from a popular poem by a man named Coventry Patmore. In the poem, he holds his angel wife up as a model for all women. The angel of the house was what Victorian society saw as the ideal woman. She would be a devoted wife and a loving mother. She was meant to be passive, powerless, meek, charming, graceful, sympathetic, self-sacrificing, pious, and pure. In the prelude to the poem Angel in the House, there is a section called The Wife's Tragedy, which states that man must be pleased, but him to please is woman's pleasure. Down the gulf of his condoled necessities, she casts her best, she flings herself. Wolf saw this ideal as being oppressive to women and impossible to maintain. Wolf's vehement declaration to drop this ideal may have had to do with her own mother, who filled this role, according to society standards, until she died in 1895. Though there is no evidence to back up this claim, as Wolf did not make any direct connections in her numerous journals. Wolf blames the lack of women in literature on their poverty, both educational and financial. She claims that these social conditions have led to the lack of historical legacy that continues to inhibit them in the present time, and that only by gaining a space in which to create, and financial freedom with which to do so, will women be able to create their own legacies separate from how men describe them. Wolf is aware that she has a particular privilege, both in her ability to gather this knowledge and her ability to share it, that many other women do not have. She views this as proof of oppression of women's voices. She claims that women before were considered worthless scientifically by the men, not because they were lesser beings, but because the men who wrote about these women were concerned not with their inferiority, but with his own superiority. She also states that she need not hate any man, he cannot hurt her, and that she need not flatter any man, he has nothing to give her, and urges her audience to do the same. At the end of the lecture, Wolf drops the narrative and speaks directly to the audience and returns to the motive of Shakespeare's sister saying, Now my belief is that this poet, who never wrote a word and was buried at the crossroads, still lives. She lives in you and in me, and in the many other women who are not here tonight, for they are washing up the dishes and putting the children to bed. She suggests that women are connected to one another, regardless of class, geography, or time that separates them. Virginia Woolf died of suicide in 1941, leaving a legacy inspiring both to writers and women alike. Wolf is now well known for her stream of consciousness writing technique, in which she attempted to make some kind of hold made of shivering fragments, and that she should like to write not only with the eye, but with the mind, and discover real things beneath the show. Wolf's narratives move between the intently psychological interior of characters to the physical realities of the body and its interactions with others. These experiments with the inner and the outer body developed and evolved into what we now consider her signature style of writing. She's known also for her part in the feminist movement of her time, by encouraging the elevation of women writers, literature that included the women's experience, and equality between the sexes in terms of education and financial freedom. She proposed that with these changes, in the future literature would be androgynous in mind, and resonate equally between men and women. Overall, in A Room of One's Own, Virginia Woolf attempts to show the need for financial and intellectual freedom, shows how women interact in society and how that's detrimental to them, and the necessity of creating a legacy of women writers. I hope the next time you look at your bookshelf, you'll see the legacy that she created with encouraging women to write.